Greetings, Oakwood. Today we will be reading Psalms 18. We will only be reading the first three verses. So I will encourage you to have your Bibles open. And as I go through it verse by verse, just follow along with me. So Psalms 18 is a psalm of praise, of gratitude, and confession by David. It recounts how God gave him military victory over his lifetime. We know this by the transcript. If you look above where it says Psalms 18, you'll see first it says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who address the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. This psalm was written when David's enemies lay at his feet. David had been given absolute victory, and he wanted to express his gratefulness to the Lord for his glorious provision. You see, and you probably know, that during the lifetime of David, he was on the run from Saul. He was in constant danger of death. Now he has been delivered from all of his enemies, and he lifts his voice in praise to the Lord God who has given him the victory. This is David's song of victory. But you and I also have victory, and we also have a song to sing as well. When God saved us, he gave us victory over our enemies. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we have been saved and delivered from the snare of the enemy, we also have ample reason to worship and praise God. And I want you to notice that David gives God the praise. He doesn't attribute his success to himself, to his military strategy. He doesn't do that. He thanks God because he knows it's God who delivered him. And this is the same with us. It is God who gives us success. It's God who gives us power and ability over our enemies. So our praise should naturally always go to God. So as I said, we will not be going through this entire psalm. It's 50 verses. We're just going through the first three. But I would like to spend a few moments speaking to you about the God we worship. And as we spend our time in these verses, let's allow the Lord's word to remind us today why our God is a God we worship. So as we look at this passage, I think the first thing David is pointing out to us is that God is worthy of our affection. At the very beginning, the psalm makes two great and profound declarations. He bears his heart and tells us what he has determined to do. First, he declares his love for the Lord. Second, he declares his absolute dependence upon the Lord. He seems to be indicating that he will live his life with these two great themes before him. He is telling us that he finds his greatest delight in the Lord. So let's examine these first two themes a little bit more closely. So verse 1 says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. What's David saying? He's saying, I will love the Lord. The word translated love here is not the usual, usual word for love. It means to yearn over. In fact, in a very literal sense, the Hebrew word means to fondle. It carries the idea of a mother's love for an infant child. It has the idea of loving one so much that you just want to hug them real close. If it doesn't sound too irreverent, David is telling us that he is so filled with love for the Lord that he just wants to slide up real close to the Lord and hug him forever. David is saying that he has his arms around God. David is describing a deep spiritual, emotional connection that he has with God. 
we might paraphrase this verse another way by saying, passionately, with yearning, with a desire to hug you, do I love you, O Lord? Have you ever felt like that? Felt a surge of spiritual emotion come over you to the point where you wish you could just put your arms around the Lord? This is certainly the type of love that we must develop in our lives. A love so strong that we can confidently say that we have our arms around God. You know, we have all felt this kind of way about somebody we love. How many of you have felt their hearts filled up with love for a child or a grandson? Or how many of you have felt this kind of love for a spouse or somebody you have a deep connection with and that you just want to reach out and hug them and hold on to them. I bet many of you could, could definitely say, yeah, that's me. This is the emotion that actually Mary Magdalene felt when she encountered the risen Christ. In John 20 and 17, what does Jesus say? He says, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Could you imagine when Mary realizes that the person with her is Jesus? She wants to cling to him. What about the disciples? The disciples, when they saw him, in Matthew 28 and 9, it recounts, it says, And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Can you imagine how they took a hold of Jesus? Their love just overflowed that they did not want to let him go. Well, consider all that the Lord has done for us and how he loves us and he has made a way for us to be saved. That Our hearts should be filled with that same kind of love that we just want to cling to the Lord, that we just want to hold on to him that we just want to declare our love to the Lord so strongly that we wouldn't let him go, that we would, in, in a sense, hug him. Another thing David wants to show us is how to lean on the Lord. He calls God my strength. Having told the Lord he wanted to hug him, David exhausts his vocabulary in telling him all that he has been to him. Nine times in the first two verses, David uses the personal possessive pronoun, my. David says the Lord is my strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my mountain, my shield, my salvation, my stronghold. You kind of get the impression that David depends on God. Now, did you realize that my is the first pronoun learned by most children? They say things like my truck, my doll my kitty, my couch, my room, my toy. This is just their childish way of stating that they know what is theirs. What David is doing is expressing simply childlike faith in his relationship with the Lord, but he elevates the possessive pronoun to the spiritual plane. He is telling us that he is totally dependent on the Lord for everything. Every ounce of his strength comes from the Lord. Now think about it. What we can do without the Lord? What can we do without the Lord? Nothing. But what can we do with the Lord? Everything. Now David's plan is to live for the Lord, love the Lord, and lean on the Lord for everything he needs in life. And I think that is a worthy goal for every believer, that we should lean on the Lord and use the Lord as our source and as our resource. God deserves nothing less than having his people lean on him. He's the one that created us. He's the one that knows what to do with us. So it is us to want the desire to lean on him. Okay, so David just showed us that God is worthy of our affection. Now David is going to show us that God is worthy of our allegiance. Look at verses 2. It says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. 
my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. You kind of get that there's a praise for a personal God, that David has a personal relationship with God. I want to take you back to the usage of my. Now understand this. The most important thing in life is knowing that you are right with God. Let me say that again. The most important thing in life is knowing that you are right with God. Be sure, above all else, that you are saved by God's grace. It isn't enough to be good or to be religious. It isn't enough to just read your Bible or join a church or just go to church. It isn't enough just to be baptized, as some may think. No, you need to have a personal relationship with God. There needs to come a time when you have gone to God on your knees and said, God, I need you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I want you to take control fully of my life. I want to walk in your ways, and I need your help to teach me to do that. There must be a time in your life where you have said that, where now you are living under the control of God and not under the control of yourself, where now you have a more spiritual bent than a bent for the things of this world. Okay, notice the strength and security that is found in these images that we just read about in verse 2. David says that God is his rock, his fortress. God is his mountain and stronghold, all of which are symbols of power and strength. God also is David's deliverer, his shield and salvation, which denotes the defense and aid that God gives. We see that power communicated of God more fully in the statement, the horn of salvation, which I will develop in a few moments. David is going to praise God for who he is. And understand, church, when we pray, when we praise, we must do it for who God is. When we listen to gospel music or Christian songs, it must be songs that praise God for who he is. A lot of the songs that we listen to now are catering more to us than it is praising God. Everything that we do in life, even listen to, even engage in, must be a praise for who God is. Okay, so there's a praise that David has for a powerful God. David finds all the strength that he needs to make it through life. Notice the eight metaphors that David uses to describe God and his power in our lives. So first, David is showing that God is our stability. David describes God as a rock. When David said, the Lord is my rock, he likely meant it in more than one sense. A rock was of much help to the ancient Judeans in a few ways. It could provide essential shade that was needed in the desert sun. It could provide shelter and provide uh, protection in cracks and crevices. It could also provide a firm place to stand and fight as opposed to sinking in the sand. David here reminds us that when it appears that the world is spinning out of control, and we see this in the riots that are going on, we also see it in this pandemic that we are in. We also see it with issues of climate change and kind of what's going on in our political world. We see the world spinning out of control. But us as believers can stand above it all when we stand on the Lord. He's our rock. He's our stability. We don't need to be confused or or in chaos like the world is in. We have a firm foundation and we must stand on that firm foundation. God allows his people to live above the trials and the turmoils that engulf the world beneath. So while the world is going crazy, God allows us as believers to be stable. Second thing, he showed us that God is our safety. David says that God is like a fortress. A fortress is a place of strength and safety. The Hebrew word for fortress in this verse is the word that gave its meaning to perhaps the greatest natural fortress in the world, Masada. 
It is a rock tower that rises out of the Judean desert opposite of the Dead Sea. It was there in the first century that a handful of Jews was held attacked from the Roman legionnaires by the thousands. They use this as a place of safety. So Masada is a fortress. It is an anchor in the bedrock. You know, the streams were not able to wash it away. The winds were not able to blow it down. It was high enough to be above the flood. And David is saying, my God is my Masada, the fortress, the stronghold, the high place, the bedrock, the foundation on which I can build my life. And that's great for us to know that to us, our God is a fortress. Third, David said God is our savior. David refers to the Lord as our deliverer or his deliverer. The word, the word refers to one who saves, one who rescues, one who delivers another from danger. This is a word that is filled with glory. You see, not only did the Lord save us when we receive him by faith, but he makes us holy, saving us day by day. And when this life is over, we will be ultimately saved when we arrive at home with him in heaven delivered from the dangers of this world. Okay, fourth, David said that God is our sovereign. David refers to him as simply God, my strong God, not only the object of my adoration, but he would, he who puts strength in my soul. It refers to God as the almighty God. This word pictures God as one who is over all things. And as one who is in control of all things, the saints of God should surely rejoice in the knowledge that everything that happens is in God's plan and that he is in control of all things, even when we cannot make sense of it. God is still on the throne. God is our sovereign. But first, he says that God, again, is my rock. When everything else in the world is being tossed around and twisted, God forever remains the same. He is stable. He is dependable. We can always depend on him. David tells us that God is all that we need. And we should rejoice in the truth that the Lord God of heaven will be the strength of our lives. So whatever we go through that confuses and confounds us, God is stable and he will be the strength of our life. None uh, of us know what we will face in the future or in the years ahead, but we know that God is in heaven and he will give us the strength we need to face life's trials and the battles that will come, but he will be our help along the way. And that's something that we could, we could be assured of we could rejoice in that god will be our help along the way of life's journey remember that he is an ever present god that's what scripture says that god is an ever present god he is not a god that comes at moments in time he's not a god that is so transcendent that we cannot have any knowledge of him we know that God is imminent. He's here. He's, he's with us. He's forever present. He's imminent. And that's, that's something that we should glory God in. But the sixth thing that David says is that God is our protector. David calls the Lord a shield who defends both his head and his heart. When trouble comes into your life and mine, Sometimes the Lord will allow those things to come and he will give us the grace to endure. However, there are times when the Lord steps between his children and the trials and acts as a shield to stand between his child and the storm that are coming. Only in heaven will we fully comprehend the times when God, in his providence, 
has intervened in our lives and delivered us from some troubled things that were ahead of us. And it's interesting to think that there are things that we could have gone through, but God stepped in between it. And he, he diverted our path to keep us safe. Man, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out all that God saved us from. All the trouble that we could have got into ourselves or all the trouble that was coming to us. That God himself came right in between. And sometimes you, you may go through a situation and, and it's not good, obviously. And it's a breaking situation. Emotionally, it wrecks you. Physically, it wrecks you. And you think, what could come good of this? It is only until God brings us out that we will be able to look back and say, ah, now it makes sense. So God is our shield. God is our security. Here, the Lord is called a horn of salvation. Now, you have to understand the image of the horn. The horn refers to animal horns used either as musical instruments or as containers for liquid, especially for oil for anointing those selected for a divine purpose. So the horn was often a symbol of strength, power, and victory, perhaps because animals contest other animals by butting and thrusting their horns. That's why we have this image. So to exalt the horn is to expand or increase uh, one's power as they secure victory. On the contrary, to cut off the horn or to dehorn uh, cattle is to limit one's effectiveness in battle and to bring about defeat. So to envision Yahweh as David's horn is to understand that God is a source of power and strength that ensures David's ultimate victory against his foes. In turn, our ultimate victory against our foes as well. Okay, eighth, God is our supply. Now, in this last metaphor, David says that the Lord is our strong tower. This refers to a great tower that were built around ancient cities. From these towers, soldiers uh, could look down on their attackers and volley arrows down on their heads. These towers were usually stocked with ammunition and with supplies. So when the soldiers ran to the high tower, they were above the battle. They were in a place where they could position themselves to see what is happening. It is a place of rest. It was a place of refreshment. And it was a place of ready supplies. God is the same for his children. When the battle rages around us, when we can run to him and be lifted above our battles and find rest and refreshment and supplies that are needed for us to win the battle. Now, surely we can rejoice in the knowledge that the Lord is always there for us to run to in the days of battle. Surely we can remember that the God that we serve is the God of the battle and that the battle, God always wins. And the battle is the Lord's, as it says in 1 Samuel 17 and 47. It is no wonder now that we see why David praises the Lord. However, we have the same reasons that he did. So we should let our praises go up to him and resolve in our hearts that we will worship and serve him in spirit and truth. Because of all these characteristics, we could have confidence in the God that we serve. So we could approach life now, confidence, with strength, with assurance, that God has our battles taken care of because the battles are his. So what have we learned? We learned that God is worthy of our affection. God is worthy of our allegiance. 
But now in verse 3, David shows us that God is worthy of our adoration. Look at what it says in verse 3. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. In this verse, David makes a pledge to call on God and to trust him and him alone for his victories in life. The idea communicated here is that David is aware of the power of this praiseworthy God and that he is pledging his life to walk in the awareness of the greatness of a powerful God. Now, you've got to be honest. When we are hard-pressed, how many of us call the therapist or the investment counselor or friends? Our intuitive response is to call people first to lean on human instruments for help. However, David is advocating that we start with God. There is no other place to turn. When we are under pressure, he is the one to whom we should go. We should go first. Before consulting anybody else, we need to consult God. When we are under pressure, go to God. So David pledges to walk by faith and not by sight. David knew that his faith in the Lord will result in his perpetual victory over his enemies. Now, surely there had been some times when David was on the run, that he thought he would be captured and killed by Saul. But God had proven greater than his enemies at every turn in life. And we could probably say that of ourselves. How many times we thought that this was the end for us. But then at every turn, God showed himself to be faithful. David knew that if God could do it yesterday, then he could be counted on to do it again tomorrow. So hold on to that truth, church. If God did it for you to, before, what is stopping God from doing it for you again? What a lesson for us to learn. As children of God, we must learn that God is all these things that David described. He will protect you. He will provide for you. He will help you. He will refresh you. He will ever be present for you. Our duty then is to walk by faith and not by sight. Let us remember whom, the, whom our Lord is and what he has done. And let us worship him, honor him, and praise him. Let us live like we believe that he is the God of of the universe. Let us pledge to walk by faith from now on. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our protector, for being our shield, for being our fortress, for being our, our present help. We, we thank you for all these attributes that David um, described you as, and we know those attributes are still relevant for today. You are everything to us and even more. So God, give us the ability now to walk by faith, to trust you. We are always shaken by the little things that disturb us in life. Oh, we could be living days good, and one thing could throw us off, and then we begin to doubt all that you have done for us. Give us the ability to walk by faith, knowing that you are going before us, knowing that you are protecting us, knowing that you let us go through things so we can be strengthened, but also you have come in between things that would have ended our lives. We thank you. So God, teach us now from this day for us to walk by faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Oakwood, I know you heard the news that they're allowing the churches to open up at 30% capacity. Many churches are doing various things. I read over some of their suggestions, and I think that it won't work for us. Um, things like wearing a mask and instead of singing, humming. <laughs> you know, we are a church that we love to sing. We love to be in fellowship with each other. So let us be wise at this time. I know a lot of you want to get back to church like I do. I, I am telling you, it is way easier to preach on a pulpit than to do this. It takes me longer to do these recordings than it does to do a sermon and preach it combined. So 
Um, as, frustrating, as frustrating as it may be, I suggest that we hold still. Let's see the results of what will happen when the city reopens more. Let's see what happens with churches. And let's actually go back when we could actually be a church again. Um, instead of wearing masks and hand sanitizers and you're suggesting plexiglass to be put between people's uh, church. I know, I've talked to uh, many of you and, and you would rather wait till we are able to open up a, a little bit more. So be patient, you know, God is with us. You still have the opportunity to connect with your brother and sister. We, you're still doing the sermons um, um, online, so that's a great opportunity for us. And starting by the end of this month, I will be doing a Bible study through Zoom. Um, so I'll give you more information uh, about that. So for now, God bless you, and I will see you next Sunday. Bye for now.